It's time to get healthy. I'm Dr. Mike Rudadoria, functional medicine, functional neurology, chiropractic, and we're going to go through it. If I were to ask you in January or February of 2020 what your priorities were for the year, there's a very good chance that your spouse, your children, your career, your future, they would have been your, probably your top three priorities. Very rarely does somebody say, my health is my priority. But we really need to start thinking you know, about why we aren't looking at it that way, especially in light of the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic. So all of a sudden now, health has become our number one priority. We don't want to get sick. So again, not being sick is not necessarily being healthy. So we don't want to get this virus. So we're doing everything we can to avoid getting it. But what we've seen and the studies are starting to show is that people who are unhealthy actually have a significant increased risk for having poor outcomes from actually getting the COVID-19 virus. The problem is that Americans are really sick. Here are some stats. 50% of us are on at least one regular prescription medication every day. 24% of us are on three medications and 13% of us are on five medications or more. Five out of six people over 65 are on at least one medication. That's almost everybody over 65. 25% of people between 60 and 85 are on psych medications. One quarter of all people over 60 are on psych meds. 6.7 million kids under 17 years old are on psych meds. 42% of the United States um, are obese and probably 60% are either obese or overweight. 47 million people now have something called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is when you're overweight, have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high blood sugar. But you know what? That metabolic syndrome is really setting the stage for increased poor outcomes for people with COVID-19. Studies are very clear that the people who are dying, you know, people who are most sick, and this is not all, of course, but the majority are really out of shape and their system is just not functioning appropriately. So there's a huge distinction between being healthy and not being sick. The fact that we live in a society that, that basically treats symptoms is a big part of the problem. So when I don't feel good or when something's wrong, I go to the doctor and the doctor checks me out and says, this is what you need to take. Here's some medication, take this. And you know, if, if it doesn't work, come back. And if, it, you know, if you feel better, then I'll see you at your next physical or when something else breaks down. But isn't it a little backward? Shouldn't we be having a doctor of prevention, somebody who's actually trying to teach us how our body works so that we're in a much better position to, to take care of it? So right now, again, we're in the middle of a, a COVID-19 crisis. Initial studies are showing that 82% of COVID-19 deaths are due to cardiovascular disease and diabetes and obesity. I hope the takeaway from this crisis is that people start to prioritize their health. And most people that have metabolic syndrome don't realize that being overweight, being pre-diabetic, meaning their blood sugar is a little high, having high, high, blood, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, will eventually kill them because they just pop pills to deal with these issues right now. So, and it seems to be almost the norm for people to be taking cholesterol medication for people to be taking uh, blood pressure medication, for people to be told that they're pre-diabetic or diabetic and, and potentially be taking metformin or other drugs for that. And we just, we just tolerate being overweight. It's just part of American society at this point. But man, when you put all those things together, it sets the stage for illness. And what this COVID um, you know, virus has done is it accelerated the death by 20 years. So instead of dying at you know, 80 people are dying at, at, uh, at, you know, 55, 60 with these underlying metabolic disorders because of the COVID virus. So we all have stress. Everybody has it. It's part of being an American, unfortunately. Uh, but not everybody has anxiety, panic, depression, substance abuse, or, you know, violence. So what is the difference? What's the missing link between stress and all of these problems? Why are some people more resilient and they're much, able to, much uh, better able to handle stress than others? And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, some people just have a positive attitude. They're innately happy. They have a strong support system. They're self-reliant. 
But what about your physical health? How does your physical health lead into your happiness? Because if you think about it, what are the only two things that matter in life? Happiness and health. And honestly, you can't be happy if you're not healthy. So food and mood. I was very I was very fortunate to be in a documentary called Food Equals Mood. And you can check it out, foodmoodfilm.com, with Dr. Kelly Brogan and Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Frank Lipman, and Dr. Perlmutter. And it was all about how food impacts our brain and our mood and our relationships. And it's really, really impactful because you realize that some of the things that we're doing on a daily basis really inhibit our ability to be happy and healthy. Is it genetic? Is there a genetic reason why people are more unhappy than others? Well, there are genetic predispositions for everything. So here is a very complicated looking chart. And if you look in the middle, you see three circles. And the middle circle says folic acid above it in red. And just below folic acid, you see something that says THF. THF is folic acid or folate, actually, natural folate that comes from plants. Well, we need folate, and we know we know that because, first of all, it's part of our um, B vitamin series. It's vitamin B9, but it plays a huge role in a central role in so many different parts of our, of our biochemistry. We know that it's important for neurology because we know that uh, women are told to take extra folic acid when they're pregnant so that their children don't have birth defects. So it's always in uh, prenatal vitamins at very high doses. But what we've recently found is that not everybody can metabolize folic acid or folate. We have genetic um, mutations that potentially can happen to us that, that reduce the body's ability to convert the THF at the top of that circle into the 5-methyl THF at the bottom of that circle. And it's called MTHFR. And it stands for methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. It's just a big word for an enzyme that allows the plant version to turn into the human version. Well, just above that in the center, you see arrows that go both ways. That one little molecule in the middle is really the key to unlock that right side cycle and the left side cycle. Now, when it goes over and unlocks that right side circle, that whole thing is about heart disease, detoxification, miscarriage, immune function, and cancer. Imagine that if you aren't able to efficiently turn the plant version of folic acid into the human version of folic acid or folate, you're not able to do any of those things. You have a significant increased risk for chronic illness. Now, the interesting thing is when you look at the one on the left, the one, the circle on the left and above it, it says amino acids. That's the cycle that actually makes your brain chemistry. And that 5-methyl THF in the bottom of that middle circle goes over and allows N amino acids called tryptophan and tyrosine, you see them at the top of that left circle, they get converted into serotonin and dopamine. And those are our brain chemicals. They're called neurotransmitters. And if you don't have sufficient amounts of serotonin and dopamine in your system, you end up with a predisposition to having anxiety and depression. Well, 50% of the population actually has a mutation in that gene that allows the plant version of folate to turn into the human form. So that's why we have a significant genetic predisposition to having anxiety and depression. The beauty is we can deal with all these things. We can test for these genes, we can test for all these different metrics, and we can actually bypass them. Another big thing that plays a role in our health and happiness is our gastrointestinal system. We know that stress causes some people to get stomach problems, right? Some people get stressed and they get irritable bowel syndrome. Well, we know that there's a giant relationship between the gut and the brain. We call it the gut-brain connection. And it's not just about digestion, although there's a big role with digestion. What we found recently in the last you know, decade or you know, two is that we have a tremendous amount of bacteria that actually lives normally in our gut. It's called the microbiome. And it's this massive, massive um, collection of different types of bacteria that live inside of us that, that play a role in our metabolism, in our brain function, and our immune system. And when this and when this microbiome is actually working appropriately, it changes everything about us. And what we're now linking, even in psychology today, what you see there on the left is, this is an article from Psychology Today, that the gut microbiome plays a huge role in anxiety. So if we have an altered gut function, we're going to have an altered brain function. We say gut on fire, brain on fire. 
So the microbiome are these trillions of microbes that inhabit our bodies. See, it used to be thought that all bacteria was bad. And we still, some, some people still think that way. Everything is antimicrobial and, you know, antibacterial soap and so on. But what it's done is it's created this sterile environment and it's altered the way our body works. So you have low levels of healthy bacteria that we call probiotics and an increased level of un unhealthy bacteria and we call that dysbiosis. And that dysbiosis in the gut has wide ranging effects on every other aspect of our health. So health is not just feeling good. Health is a balancing act. The goal is to be optimal. We would need to sleep normally. We need to poop normally, breathe fresh air, drink clean water. We have to think good thoughts. We have to get exposure to natural sunlight. We have to have good nutrition and supplementation and exercise. And when we put a plan in place that we're doing all those things, the body works really well. The body is an amazing self-healing, self-regulating organism. And all we need to do is get out of its way. But we have lived in a very strange society. Our society that is technology driven, we're sitting way too much. We're overexposed to abnormal EMF from computers and iPhones and, and indoor lights. We don't get nearly as much sunlight or exercise. We're, we're constantly toxic. So all of these things inhibit our health. And then we, we wonder why we don't feel good. Genetically, we're about 99% the same. However, when you look at this epigenetics, which is the way our genes function, this microbiome, the gut bacteria, our diet, our light environment, our sleep patterns, hormone regulation, and exercise habits, we're all very, very, very different. So here are some negative health impacts. We know the three biggest things that potentially can change your biochemistry are inflammation, inflammation, and inflammation. And inflammation is a normal process in the body. So for, for argument's sake, if I bang my elbow on my desk, I get a big swelling and, and a big swollen elbow. That's a normal part of the healing process. But when that swelling continues and, it, and it's perpetuated throughout my whole body and it stays present throughout my system, that will actually start breaking down my body. So I know that um, if, I'm, if I'm inflamed, that I have a now I have an increased risk for chronic illness because all chronic illnesses are related to high inflammation levels. We also know that um, nutrient imbalances and changes in the gut can also have massive negative health impacts. So inflammatory diseases. All of these different things, insomnia, anxiety, depression, migraine, fatigue, brain fog, dementia, diabetes, obesity, autoimmunity, thyroid, rheumatoid, cancer, heart disease, stroke, colitis, and metabolic syndrome are all inflammatory disorders. Every single one of them is related to chronic inflammation. So what we do, though, is we say, oh, you have a thyroid problem. Let's deal with your thyroid. Let's give you X, not XYZ. Let's give you levothyroxine, and that'll fix your thyroid problem. But if we don't remove the inflammation, the thyroid's going to continue to be problematic. Same thing with heart disease. You know, we can be taking... Uh, medication to deal with our um, our blood pressure, or maybe we take medication to bring down our uh, cholesterol level, but it doesn't do anything to remove the inflammation. The numbers next to each of these things are the numbers of hits that you will get when you Google that term and the word inflammation. So when you Google insomnia and inflammation, you get 21.6 million hits in less than a second. What that does is it shows the correlation between the two. When you realize that you're getting millions and millions and millions of hits of connecting these two things, you realize these are all inflammatory problems. So here's a way that we can look at inflammation. Inflammation is the burning sun on the left. And when we have inflammation chronically, we get an increase in something called NF-kappa B. And we can look at different blood tests, really simple blood tests called HSCRP and ESR. One of them is C-reactive protein, and one of them was called the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. That tells us about how our body is working when it comes to inflammation. And what you look at here is that inflammation can cause something called oxidative stress, or oxidative stress can actually cause inflammation, which is a change in our body's what we call redox potential, or our balance between antioxidants and oxidants. We know that poor sleep can cause inflammation. We know that brain inflammation from, let's say, a head, head injury can cause inflammation. We know that a change in your gut function can cause inflammation, and that inflammation can cause a problem with your gut. We know that chronic stress can cause inflammation, and then stress then causes alterations in your stress chemistry. 
Here's something interesting. When you look at stress chemistry in the middle, when you're stressed and you have high levels of stress chemicals like cortisol and so on, it suppresses something called Th1 function. Th1 is an immune system function that allows us to fight off bacteria and viruses. Isn't that interesting? So being stressed actually increases your risk to getting an infection. And once you have a decreased Th1 response, you have an associated increased Th2 response, which increases your risk for asthma and allergies, but also increases your risk for autoimmunity. And then all of these things have an impact on our cancer risk and, and so on and so forth. So when we look at what, what causes inflammation, these are the causes. An exposure to EMF, this MTHFR mutation, changes in what we call mitochondrial function or the energy production parts of our cells. Alcohol and you know too much alcohol or, or a poor diet, gastrointestinal issues, obesity, high blood sugar, a low sun exposure, like a sunlight deficiency is a real thing. No exercise or low levels of exercise, poor nutrient status, infections, toxins, a low resilience to stress, or a high ACE score. ACE score is the adverse childhood events um, assessment that you can do um, right online. Just Google it, the ACE test, and it's 10 questions. And it tells us about, you know, maybe uh, adverse events that we experienced as children. And it predisposes us to having increased problems with anxiety and depression later on in life. All of these things cause inflammation. So when we look at the chart, what we see is everything on the left are the causes. Then we, our body goes through this massive change, and then what we end up is what things on the right. So instead of just trying to treat the stuff on the right, what we need to do is try to eliminate the things on the left. So here's, a, here's an example. Here's a 62-year-old male. He had been referred by, uh, by his doctor because he just was taking multiple medications for other things, and now he realized that he needed to start taking medication for diabetes. And he said, no, I don't want to do that. And he said, well, listen, you're going to go see Dr. Mike and maybe we can do a lifestyle modification. So he had a long history of obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, elevated blood sugar. He had no libido, no sex drive. He wasn't able to have uh, to, uh, to get an erection. He had little to no exercise in his life. He was in a toxic relationship with food. He was in love with food. He had an unhealthy relationship. And, and this was a big part of his issue. Um, but he said, like, I'm retired, I have a nice life, but now I'm 62 and I'm chronically sick. I'm always at the doctor, I don't feel good. And these are his labs, uh, fasting glucose. So after 12 hours of not eating, his blood sugar, which ideally should be about 80, is at 154. His insulin levels off the chart. He had inflammation and multiple levels of inflammation. One of them is his ferritin evaluation. You can see how high that is. But meanwhile, on the left, his cholesterol is normal because he was taking all these cholesterol medications. When we look at a, st a stool profile, and I think that every single person should get a stool profile, this tells us about what's going on on the inside. And this particular patient had an elevation in this thing called putrefactive SCFA, which is short-chain fatty acids. And what that does is it tells us that food is actually rotting. Proteins are rotting in this person's belly. And what we see here is that meat fibers are showing up in the stool because they're not being digested. This Digestion issue, because the, the gastrointestinal system works from north to south, digestion causes, a poor digestion causes changes in the microbiome. And then that can lead to weight loss resistance. So people who are overweight or struggling with weight loss, we always need to look at what's going on with their gut because they can have an abnormal situation in the gastrointestinal system that's actually preventing them from losing weight. Here's a little bit more of that same test. And what we see at the top is a beneficial bacteria all those probiotics, people are familiar with that. And we see that the main one called lactobacillus is no growth. They have no growth at all. NG is no growth. So they have none of the good guy, which is lactobacillus. And then they have six additional bacteria growing, which represents an overgrowth of bad bacteria. And then they also have a yeast infection in their gastrointestinal system. So this represents a totally abnormal um, gastrointestinal lining, which is what we call the microbiome. This is another part of that same evaluation, that same stool test. And what we see here, everything is supposed to be in the middle of the white checkered box. And this person is way off the chart. So they're not able to absorb fats. And your brain is 60% fat. So we, all, we look at this and we say, well, I'm eating fats. I'm eating healthy fats. But it's not just what you eat. It's what you absorb. So if you're pooping out all healthy fats, you have an increased risk for brain-related issues.
Again, this patient came in and had no healthy bacteria whatsoever and high levels of um, something called Klebsiella, which is actually a potentially pathogenic. These are some other common findings. This is a thyroid profile. And usually when people go in and they get their thyroid evaluated, they get the TSH level done and they get something called free T4 done. And according to the American Academy on Endocrinology, if we do TSH and free T4 and they're within normal limits, you're considered normal. The problem is that the thyroid makes two hormones, T4 and T3, and it's not part of the regular evaluation. So when we test this person's T3, we see, oh my God, this person has hypothyroidism, but it's not picked up on the traditional tests because doctors aren't testing for T3. These are other, these other two tests that we need to test people for when we look at the ESR, which is the SED rate, which tells us about full body inflammation, it's supposed to be under 26, ideally less than 10. This person's at 42. And then high sensitivity CRP, which is supposed to be ideally around 1, 1 to 2, and they're at 16.4. So these are really telling things that every single person needs to get done, but they're just not getting done. This tells us about health. This doesn't tell us just about, you know, the fact that, you know, we don't have a, a liver issue, for instance. Um, this is another test that we can look at adrenal function. It's actually a saliva test. And what we see is that you're supposed to have elevated cortisol in the morning. We have something called a cortisol waking response that helps us wake up and gets our brain alive in the morning. And everything's supposed to be in that dark green zone. So it's supposed to start out at about 25. So what's happening is this person's flat. Their, their line is totally flat. So they have very low levels of energy because their adrenal functions off as a result of everything else being out of balance. And this is a test that we look for toxins. So we don't usually think about toxins because we never get them tested, but we can actually do a test where we look at urine and see what's actually going on in somebody's body. And what we see here is that toxins are off the chart. Lead and mercury are very, very high. So if your body has toxin of heavy toxin load, you know, you're never going to be able to be truly healthy. What are the solutions? Obviously, we need, to, we need to get back to nature. We have to get outside. We have to reinstate our circadian rhythms. We need to set up our day-night cycles. We need to sleep appropriately. We need to have a, a healthy diet. We need to be exercising. We need to take the right supplements. So a functional medicine approach is really about developing a relationship with a patient and establishing a baseline. Where are you right now? Not only what's going on with you or what's not working well, but how's your life going? happy are you? How are you sleeping? How are you functioning? And we need to get this baseline with blood, urine, stool, and genetic tests so we can understand objectively what's going on. Then we need to set some goals, figure out exactly what's happening and where you want to be. And then what I'll do is create a program of detoxification and nutrition and supplementation, exercise, light environment shifts, and just a different way of thinking to realize that if I want to get into good shape and I want to be healthy, I have to change the way I think. And that's where this mindset shift comes in. It's not just about, you know, doing. It's not just about taking action because you can't get sick. I mean, you can't get healthy in the same environment that you got sick. So it's very, very important that you change the way you think. So in functional medicine, what we do is not only recommend these changes, but we hold your hand and kick your butt all the way through. So we meet every week and we really dig in and make significant changes to work that plan. You know, when we look at labs, we're not just looking at these at, you know, whether it's out of range, because if they're abnormally high or low, that's obvious. But what I'm looking for is optimal. Optimal is right in the middle of that range. So when we when we take a look at those labs and we can make some generalized recommendations or some very specific ones. But if you were to build a basic supplement program, I mean, my recommendation would be obviously vitamin D3, pre and probiotics, digestive enzymes maybe magnesium, B12, zinc, fish oil, and ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C. These are the basics, but this doesn't really take into account your uniqueness. But I just wanted to give some recommendations because I want to really put it out there that people need to just take control of their health. So if you have any interest in getting involved with a totally altered lifestyle program and helping you get to really be healthy, you know, check out the optimumu.com and give us a call and we'll set you up.